Hi, I'm Richard Campbell from .NET Rocks and Run As Radio. I'm here at NDC Melbourne for the first show ever, and I had the good fortune to give the keynote. It was about the next decade of software development, and this is a little piece from that. It's one of the last parts I did, talking a bit about quantum computers. Quantum computers have come a long way in the past few years. Even during the pandemic, we had substantial progress. And we don't need to get in the nitty gritty of quantum. It gets pretty confusing. It's a tough science, but in the end, in the mechanical perspective of this, we're making electronic components that have to be soaked in liquid helium, very, very cold, down to about two or three degrees Kelvin to enable to stay entangled so they can do quantum calculations for us. And that makes it very challenging to work with, not just keep them that cold, but then still being able to interact with them to get the information out. We typically do that through magnetic fields. And at this point, in quantum technology, there are lots of different approaches to uh, implementing quantum computers. There's no one right way. It's too early days yet. Now, a couple of years ago, in 2019, Google had a breakthrough with their Sycamore processor. This was a 54-qubit quantum computer, although in the actual record-setting test run, they only had 53 qubits because one of them was broken. And they ran a quantum random number problem uh, that ran about 200 seconds long and was believed to take about 10,000 years of the classical computer to solve. Although IBM, a rival in the quantum space, then showed a solution for that same problem on a classical computer to take about two and a half days, which is still a heck of a lot longer than 200 seconds. So I think we can put the quantum su supremacy crown on Google that they sort of did the first trial runs with a quantum computer to show some meaningful computing potential, but not really important problems yet. But time marches on, and back in 2020, the Chinese group with the Zhuzhang uh, photonic quantum computer, so a completely different design using photonic entanglement, had 113 entangled qubits to do a 200 second run on a Boson sampling problem. And they got positive results from that. And the current estimate, if they were going to do that particular set of calculations with a classical computer, would be about two and a half billion years. I don't know if we could cut that down to 100 million years. Either way, it doesn't matter. Heck of a great achievement. And interesting to see completely different quantum computer designs in progressing in the, this technology. IBM, and this is just last year in 2021, with their Eagle processor. This is the Transmon architecture that is uh, still using liquid he helium and that deep cooling, but they're up to 127 qubits. We haven't gotten particularly meaningful results yet. They're still doing the testing, but they have an architecture that they're progressing with that they say by next year, by 2022 or the end of this year, we're supposed to get 433 qubits. I don't know if they're going to make it, but it represents progress. But really the question we're looking at is, like, what are we going to do with quantum computers that's important, that actually makes a difference? All of these experiments are great. We're validating the model. And believe me, the issue here is not encryption. That's certainly what the press jumps on. Yes, it's possible for quantum computers to break RSA encryption because it's dependent on primes. But first off, it's a very hard problem for quantum computers to deal with, and we'll need much more advanced quantum computers than we're building right now to do that. And B, it is just not that difficult for us to switch over to non-prime-based encryption. Lattice encryption is perfectly capable of protecting data in a form that is not easily broken by quantum computers. So don't worry about that part. Think about more meaningful things. So let me start with agriculture. So we know in modern agriculture that if you plant a given crop on a piece of soil, say wheat, after they, it's harvested, if you plant the same wheat the next year, you're going to get smaller growth because the soil's been depleted of certain nutrients. You need to fertilize that soil to replenish it. And we have industrial processes to make fertilizer today. Starting back in World War I, the Haber-Bosch process, which was actually developed to make explosives, but explosives and fertilizer are very similar to each other, now is used all over the world to produce fertilizers to be able to grow plants year over year reliably. In fact, it's 1% of humans' power consumption all over the world. And yet, long ago, in the early days of agriculture, we learned to do crop rotation to replenish soil. So typically, after you'd grow wheat, you would plant a bean crop. And beans have a rhizome on their root that actually creates its own fertilizer. So you'd have a year of growing wheat and then a year of growing beans, and then you'd plow the root system under after harvesting the beans, let it fallow for a year, and the following year you could grow wheat again. Now, we've studied the rhizome on the bean plant for many, many years, over 100 years, and we've narrowed it down to a particular protein called nitrogenase. And the nitrogenase protein assembly somehow takes hydrogen from water and nitrogen from the atmosphere and makes it into ammonia, the base elements of fertilizer. 
Now this is an interaction that's catalytic between molybdenum and iron inside of the, that nitrogenase enzyme. And to compute that is a computing problem at about 2 and to the 170th as of a complex number. And that's more atoms there are on the planet by a long way. It's a very challenging problem. The expectation is that something in the neighborhood of a 200 qubit quantum computer, full entanglement and reliability and error correction, should be able to solve that problem in a matter of minutes. Now that wouldn't change everything instantly, but it, once we understood the catalytic reaction behind nitrogenase, we could now be on an engineering practice to actually reproduce that catalytic reaction, which would reduce our energy production for fertilizer, but also mean we could reduce fertilizer much more precisely. I envision a little stake that you put in the ground beside your plant, maybe runs on a watch battery, and it's able to take nitrogen from the air and water vapor and just put the fertilizer down that your plant needs at any given time pretty powerful change and it's one of the example of hundreds of quantum chemistry problems that we could be solving. The same applies for batteries. We've been improving battery technology largely by direct experimentation. It's almost alchemy to take different compounds together and then to run tests on the battery to see how well they work. Quantum computers could help us model battery behavior in a deeper way that could give us a substantial jump in the improvement of batteries. And the same for superconductors. For the long time, the only superconductors we knew of were things like niobium tin that had to be cooled with liquid helium. In the 80s, the Rebco class of superconductors were identified. They're a ceramic that can be cooled with liquid nitrogen. We now understand better that superconductivity is really a phase of matter, but the interactions are too complex for us to understand without quantum computers. And again, being able to make a room temperature superconductor is one of those holy grails of technology that can make a huge difference for society. But you notice that all of these are very deterministic problems. You solve them once, you don't need to solve them again. And it begs the question, like, how many quantum computers do you need? And this is where I tap back on history and realize, you know, history may not repeat, but it does rhyme. And Thomas Watson is apocryphally quoted, he didn't actually say this, that when they first were building the, the first mainframes at IBM, they thought there was maybe a market for five of them. Because back then, you know, computers were very unique. They were bespoke machines built specifically for an application. They used a different kinds of bits. Some of them were mechanical, some of them were electrical, some of them were vacuum based. We didn't have the kind of transistor that we ultimately emerged onto. The bit wasn't settled in the early days of classical computers. It wasn't until Shockley and Fairchild with the, the integrated circuit actually got to the point of building reliable bits that all of our technology is now built on for the most part. And there's a great story of Shockley who helped invent the original gallium transistor, actually used those archaic mainframe computers to compute the models for building doped silicon that he identified that phosphorus would be the appropriate element to add to silicon to create P-type substrates. And it rhymes to me that I suspect these unusual, unstable, bespoke quantum computers may be just the machines we need to determine the stable qubit to get to the same place that integrated circuits with silicon did to make the stable bit. I think we'll have the same thing happen with the qubit, and that would be a revolution we may not understand right now. When this is your computer, this giant, huge machine, it's impossible to envision the smartphone. So perhaps we'll get to that place where we actually have stable quantum computers in the meter pockets. I just can't imagine what the work will do. I do know it'll be exciting. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Talk to you again.